Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism Global Journalism Seminar. The freedom of the press is both vital and something that really should not be taken for granted in the UK or anywhere in the world. In particular, the right of journalists to hold the powerful to account, to question and investigate the workings of government in peacetime, in a crisis and during a pandemic is an important one and is one that's being questioned everywhere. I'm truly pleased to have with us today the Zimbabwean journalist Hopewell Chinyona with us today. Hopewell, who studied at City University in London and worked at the BBC World Service, returned to his native Zimbabwe in 2007 to carry on as an investigative journalist and documentary maker. Ten years later, Robert Mugabe, the long-standing president of Zimbabwe, stepped down after 37 years. His successor, President Emerson Mnangagawa, or the crocodile who took over, was part of the old regime, but there was hope that there would be change. Well, we have seen in the last year how much change there has been, and the answer is sadly not very much. In particular, Hopewell, in the last six months, has been arrested three times. He has spent 81 days of the past six months in prison. His story is an important one because he has been jailed partly for his work investigating scandals over COVID-19 um, protective equipment procurement, uh, a story that ultimately did lead to the resignation of a health minister, but also for a presence on social media that the government considers destabilizing and unsettling. And it's a really important discussion to have about the role of social media, the so so role of journalism and the role of activism. So I'm really happy to have Hopewell. As usual, the question and answer box is open. You may not see the questions, but we will. So please do type in the questions as you go along and I'll put them to Hopewell. Hopewell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Hopewell, how are you? You were released from jail in, your last stint in jail in late January, is that right? That's correct. Um, I was last arrested on the 8th of, uh, January, which was the third arrest, um, and I came out of prison last week, Friday. Um, I'm fine uh, physically and, and mentally, um, but you know, I was released from a maximum prison and I'm now home, but I consider even my existence outside the maximum prison is of one who is in jail because you are constantly being intimidated, harassed, and you're not able to do your work as a journalist the way, the way that you should be doing it. Could you just talk us through what, what, what landed you in prison this time? And then a little bit about the interaction. Have you, been, have you stood trial? What, what, what have the accusations against you been? And how have you been able to defend yourself? Um, the third time, which was on the 8th of January, I was arrested uh, supposedly for posting something on Twitter, uh, which implicated uh, a police officer who uh, was supposed to have killed a child. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the police and the state lied in court that I had done that. I never tweeted that. Um, then secondly, they charged me under a law which does not exist. It was expunged from the Zimbabwean statutes uh, and penal code in 2014. So my detention was actually illegal, but the magistrate upheld that my detention was uh, legal, which is a story for another day. Um, the first time that I was arrested was on the 20th of July, um, supposedly for inciting people to uh, get involved in, in, in violence which again was not true. Um, I was simply doing my work as a journalist and reporting on what was happening in Zimbabwe. I had uncovered with uh, two other journalists a big scandal where the Minister of uh, Health and the political surrogates around him were looting money from a 60 million US dollar facility meant to buy and, and procure COVID-19 PPEs for our health delivery system. Um, and, and, and for that, I was thrown into prison for 45 days. Um, and then the second time, uh, a lady called Henrietta Schuyler, who's the president's niece, was called at the Robert Mugabe International Airport with six kilograms of gold. Um, I got wind from my sources that they'd done a corrupt deal so that she's given bail uh, without the state opposing it. And when I reported that on Twitter as a journalist, I was again arrested and jailed and I spent uh, 17 days at Chikurubi Maximum Prison, which is the worst prison in Africa. 
Could you just tell us a little bit about the conditions in these prisons? The conditions in the prisons are terrible. They are horrible. Uh, to start with, uh, a lot of uh, prison inmates uh, die in these prisons because they don't have access to proper uh, welfare. They don't have access to proper health care. For instance, when my doctor, my private doctor came to see me, he wanted to check my high blood pressure. The prison hospital, which is a, 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 a hospital to a prison, the biggest prison in Zimbabwe, did not have a high blood um, uh, pressure machine, which costs five US dollars or two pounds. Um, the quality of diet is extremely terrible. The prisoners are woken up in the morning and they are given uh, porridge, which is nothing. In the afternoon, they are given beans, which is boiled uh, with nothing, without uh, cooking oil or tomatoes or onions, with badly cooked uh, cornmeal. And they're the same diet, uh, the same meal is repeated in the evening. And that's what they have 24 seven for 365 days. Sometimes they'll get spinach if they're lucky, but that's, that's the diet that they get. Right now, um, when I was arrested in July, it was COVID time. We were actually under a lockdown. Uh, the prisoners in the, in the prison, about 2,500 to 2,700 prisoners did not have masks. I and my co-accused, at the time when we entered prison, were the only people that were actually wearing masks whilst in prison. They didn't have masks. The state could not provide masks. And this is a result, a direct consequence of the looting of public funds that uh, I always talk and write about. It is about the plunder of Zimbabwe's natural uh, resources, which I always talk about. The, the third thing, the third thing is that um, whilst I was whilst I was there as well, I realized that um, the World Health Organization uh, protocol, which is also followed by the Zimbabwean government uh, in, in in writing, uh, in theory, states that people should wash their hands. Prisoners did not have uh, washing soap. They could not even give them toilet paper. Even when I was there this time around, prisoners did not have toilet paper. They used Bible pages as toilet paper, which is quite tragic. And um, there is no facility which gives prisoners a, 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 an, an opportunity to rehabilitate themselves so that when they are released, they become better members of society and they throw away their past deeds if they were uh, convicted genuinely. Thank you so much. It sounds really terrifying. You've been a journalist and a journalist that's been a thorn in the government side for over two decades. Had you been arrested before or jailed before 2020? Under Rod but Mugabe, I was never jailed. Uh, I was never arrested. They would intimidate you. They would uh, give you a phone call. Uh, sometimes they would engage you. Um, we thought that Robert Mugabe's administrations were the worst. We never thought that one day we could turn around and say Robert Mugabe was better than someone. But this is what the general populace of Zimbabwe is now saying. Even if you go to rural areas, when people reflect on their economic uh, circumstances, the poverty that is biting, the lack of uh, medication in hospitals, the lack of books in schools, the lack of jobs, 95% of our potential workforce is out of work. They, they are staying at home. These people are now saying that Robert Mugabe was better. We know better as journalists that uh, it's no longer just about individuals. It's the whole system that is corrupt. It is the whole system that is, is responsible for the looting of public funds. But as we are uh, existing in Zimbabwe at the moment, Emerson Mnangagwa is seen as worse than Robert Mugabe. And that's a very terrible uh, indictment. In going back to journalism in particular, you, you operate as a freelance journalist and a lot of your work's been published by Zim Live. What do you get as the sense of state of play for independent journalism in Zimbabwe? How much maneuverability do they have and do they have a kind of financial viability at the moment? I think journalism in Zimbabwe has suffered the same way as other professions have suffered. Uh, it's not disconnected from the economic circumstances uh, in the country. So you find that a lot of uh, journalists were laid off. Um, these big companies 
uh, that were operating in Zimbabwe, some of them folded. Uh, so there's no advertising for the media. So the quality of journalism has really gone down because uh, journalism needs funding. And most of the funding was coming through advertising. But since industry shut down, since there's no business taking place in Zimbabwe, these uh, journalists uh, were laid off. And so because of that, the quality has gone down. Um, the state controls a, the, a massive majority of uh, media outlets in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe only has one television station, which is uh, the only country in Africa which is not at war, which has only one television station. Uh, and yet Zimbabwe in 1960 uh, was one of the first two countries with Nigeria to have a TV station in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, radio licenses were issued around 2011, 2012. They were all given to cronies of ZANU-PF. One was given to a government minister. One was given to a state-owned uh, uh, media company called Zim Papers. This time around, uh, TV licenses have been issued again. And again, like with the radio licenses, they were issued to cronies of the government. One was even issued to a wife of a sitting uh, government minister. That's how terrible it is. So there is no private um, and independent broadcasting taking place in Zimbabwe. They are all controlled directly by the government or indirectly through the ZANU-PF surrogates. So the state of media is really terrible. We used to have one of the best media in, in, the, in the continent, but not anymore. I remember that. That's what, it's, it's extraordinary how far Zimbabwe has fallen. Can we talk a little bit about digital journalism in particular, because that, that's your format. And what spaces do you see there for investigative reporting? And crucially, what role do you see social media playing in this role, in this area? I think social media has been God sent, uh, not only to Zimbabwe, but to all um, countries that have been suffering from repressive uh, regimes like the one that we have in Zimbabwe. Uh, social media is a game changer in the sense that uh, as journalists, we are now able to communicate and post news. And that is why you find that I'm being arrested by the Zimbabwean government is because they are struggling to come to terms with the new world reality that there is social media, that you cannot control the flow of information the way they used to do in the 80s and 90s. The same people uh, that were media bureaucrats for the government are still the same people who are media bureaucrats for the government today. And they have not adjusted, they've not moved on, they have no new ideas, and they're trying to use the same repressive methods that they used in the 80s uh, to stop us from disseminating information as citizens. So if you see Hopo Shimono being arrested, uh, it's meant to instill the fear of God in young journalists that if you report uh, in a way that we do not like, this is what we will do to you. He is an award-winning, internationally recognized journalist and we're throwing him into prison. What of you? Does it work? Do you feel that young journalists do get intimidated by this messaging? Uh, you, you know, invariably you are going to have one or two that are going to be intimidated. But generally what we've seen is a trend of defiance from young journalists who are continuing to report on the situation, even reporting on my, on my case. Um, and uh, it has been working, uh, it, the defiance has been working because it is cushioned uh, around constitutionalism. These young journalists are doing what the constitution says that they can do. So it, you will find one or two are intimidated, but the majority so far are reporting as they used to report. So it seems to me that it provides kind of a sense, a place to network and show solidarity with each other as well as spreading information, which I think is vital in this in this area. Can I ask you a little bit about Zimbabwe's cybersecurity bill? Um, there's kind of introduction of new cybersecurity bills that will again give the military quite a lot of power to um, crack down on freedom of expression. How concerned are you that if this does become law, um, this is going to have a chilling effect on what, what people like you can do on social media? I'm extremely concerned, especially the false equivalences that are used by the Zimbabwean government uh, when they talk about these bills 
and laws being in, in Western countries. Um, what we have is, is a regime that does not respect the constitution, a regime that will go and resuscitate old laws to, in order to persecute its uh, supposed adversary, political adversaries, um, critics or journalists. So this, uh, these cyber laws are meant to muzzle the, the press, they are meant to muzzle uh, the citizens. If you see it, what has been happening uh, to me, they've been unconstitutionally using uh, laws that are not supposed to be used in courts of law. So this is now meant to, 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 to buttress the repression with laws that may be unconstitutional, but they will still use them. You see, what Robert Mugabe perfected, what his administrations perfected, was the fact that he would go to parliament and pass a law, as my lawyer Beatrice Mtetwa says all the time, which says that it is now legal to slap you in the face. So when they come and they slap you in the face and you complain, they say, no, wait a minute, this is legal. There's a law that says so. And that's exactly the same book that um, Emerson Mnangagwa is now trying to throw at us, to go and enact laws that will muzzle us as, as journalists, that will muzzle the citizenry so that they are not able to communicate with themselves. The fact that I'm talking to you right now and that there are thousands of Zimbabweans that are watching this conversation is a testimony Money to how we've been deprived of alternative media outlets. So social media has become the, the, the only outlet for Zimbabweans to engage with each other or to share information or for us as professional journalists to put information out. So these cyber laws are meant to try and curtail and at sometimes stop that. And it's very clear how social media helps, but you are also the target of a huge amount of trolling. I've seen this on my own Twitter feed when just publicizing this seminar. There's a kind of huge amount of trolls who come out and start attacking. Um, how do you deal with it? And crucially, do you get any support from the platforms or do you have a kind of any kind of mechanism to report any of this? Uh, what I've done is uh, I, I, I ignore when I'm using Twitter, when trolls come, I just block them. Uh, and and, and ZANU PF has got a farm of trolls. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, even the, the spokesperson for the president, he, he runs a trolling account. Um, each time when something is posted that they don't like, you will use that trolling account to insult. Um, there's a South African journalist called Sophie Mokena. Uh, she's the foreign news editor for the biggest uh, broadcaster in, in Africa, South African Broadcasting Corporation. She was being trolled by the president's spokesperson, George Charamba. And um, when he starts doing that, then you find these hundreds of uh, trolls that will come and join him and attack. So what we simply do as journalists or as citizens is to block them. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I know executives at Twitter. When something becomes uh, chilling, I inform them and they deal with the situation. And we also have a problem now in Zimbabwe where these trolls actually report genuine accounts of people. And sometimes because Twitter and Facebook, they all use algorithms in dealing with these reports, genuine accounts are shut down. And um, we have had newspapers, we've had uh, journalists, uh, we've had political commentators having their accounts shut down through algorithms. But I've been fortunate enough to be in a position where I got in touch with Twitter and these accounts are opened. Thank you. I'm just going to go to some of the questions because there are there are a lot of journalists and certainly journalists from Africa as well who really want to ask you some things. Of going first to Mark Olu, who's a who's from Kenya and one of our journalist fellows. It's it's clear that the state is bent hell bent on muzzling independent press and using its own media to safeguard the president's interests. Um, and I'm sure, and he's sure that ordinary Zimbabweans are concerned. But why is it then that the Herald newspaper and the ZBC? remain the most PC broadcaster remain the most popular in amongst Zimbabwean audiences, even though they're state controlled. So I think I, I, I think I think the idea that they are most popular is a misconception. The Herald is selling less than five thousand copies a day 
and, and this was even confirmed by the president's spokesperson. Um, ZBC, people only watch it for sports uh, or whether there is a, a, an address by the president and they want to listen to what he's saying and understand and hear how it impacts their lives. But they are not popular at all. If you go to their social media accounts, you realize that there is a huge subscription to them, but the the interactions uh, uh, do not point to a popular media outlets. In fact, people go there to express and vent their anger um, because they see these institutions as uh, representative of, of the state itself. Thank you. As a journalist, and there's a few journalists asking, this is kind of an obvious question, but a really important one. How safe is it to report on current affairs in the current regime? And how do you balance the need to report with personal safety? And like you said, you, you were personally arrested, partly to be made an example of and to, um, to frighten other people. But there are also other journalists with a much less visible profile and with much less of an international connection than you, who really could go into one of these prisons and disappear, never be heard of from again. So what advice would you give to the journalists in Zimbabwe and other countries really trying to make these decisions on a daily basis? I think it's important for journalists to support each other. I'm fortunate enough that I've got a very good and, uh, and uh, uh, active lawyer, Miss Beatrice Ntietwa. Um, and I'm fortunate enough that I have a, a a family that begs me in whatever I'm doing, as long as I'm doing things that are legal. Um, but you know, I've noticed that there's a sense of fear, intimidation that is uh, instilled in in young, especially young journalists. And as you rightly pointed out, they don't have a profile and name recognition that I have. So sometimes they are scared of doing certain things, of reporting in a certain way, although it's a legitimate uh, form of journalism, because they don't have the, the, the support that they require. So it's important for journalists in different countries to have a, a, a journalism network which supports colleagues when they are in trouble. Uh, here in Zimbabwe, we have the Media Institute uh, for Southern Africa, Zimbabwean chapter. Uh, we have the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, which comes out for us when we are arrested on trumped up charges. Um, and we also um, have lawyers and doctors who are prepared to give their services a time for free in helping journalists because the societies where we come from must understand that when journalism is attacked, it is their right to receiving information uh, that has been attacked. And when they are not able to receive legitimate information, they are not able to interact and to engage with um, political institutions in those countries or institutions that are supposed to look after their needs like councils, uh, like libraries, and because you know that information will not be coming. So it's also important for ordinary citizens to get uh, behind people who are being persecuted like myself. I've been fortunate enough that Zimbabweans, they support me on social media, they come and support me. I mean, obviously they can't go on the streets because they know the repercussions. Um, in, in 2018, people, six people were killed and there hasn't been any consequence for those killings uh, or, 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 or extrajudicial killings by the state. Uh, in, South, in Southern Africa, I, I, I've been able to get a lot of support from ordinary citizens, especially from South Africa. The Zimbabwean Lives Matter uh, started from South Africa. Um, so it's important for society to understand that it must uh, protect journalists and support them when they're doing their work. Thank you. That goes very nicely to my next question it's from Jennifer Sanders, who's asking about South Africa. And she's asking, why do you think South Africa is not supporting um, your, your reporting or challenging the Zimbabwean government um, enough? And this is kind of almost a diplomatic issue rather than to do with people where I do understand there's a lot of support. But are you disappointed with the kind of lack of vocal support from the South African government? I mean, especially I mean, given your reporting from Bite Bridge as well. Uh, I think the Zimbabwean crisis has been with us for the past 20 years, from 2000. Um, and, and, and South Africa uh, has been supporting ZANU-PF. 
Uh, and this is historical because they see each other as uh, siblings, ZANU-PF and the African National Congress, which is the ruling party in South Africa. Uh, they are politicians in South Africa who have business interests in Zimbabwe, and they support ZANU-PF because they, it protects their business interests. But we've been seeing a shift lately uh, with uh, members of the South African uh, government and the cabinet, uh, like the chairperson of the South African uh, uh, African National Congress, Gwede Mandashe, speaking out against ZANU-PF, uh, condemning it for uh, its threats against uh, the South African media. And we have seen the, the finance minister, uh, uh, Tito Boweni doing the same thing, saying that the relationship between their government and the government of Zimbabwe and the both political parties uh, is based on abuse and the abuse is coming from ZANU-PF. We've seen the African Union speak for the first time when I was arrested uh, in July. They spoke against um, my arrest and incarceration and the incarceration of other citizens who had been arrested at the same time with myself. And the Zimbabwean government actually attacked the African Union calling it a surrogate of uh, Western power and that it was being told what to say by the West, which is, of course, a laughable um, a mantra that we, we, we are now used to. Uh, so there's been a shift, but we would like to see more from the South African government because it wields that sort of power. And that sort of power is historical. For us to get independence at the time that we got it, South African, the apartheid regime played a very important role in forcing the racist regime of Ian Smith to come to terms with the fact that uh, black majority rule was now a reality that he could not uh, avoid. And the South, current South African government could do the same thing, forcing the ZANU-PF government to realize that the upholding of the constitution, the Zimbabwean constitution, is a reality that ZANU-PF can no longer avoid but needs to engage with. Thank you very much. I mean, a question from Benjunia Chimbamu. Would you advise all Zimbabweans abroad who um, who want to help to come back and fight corruption, or is this something that should be done more effectively on social media? Is it kind of something that you, where you need a campaign with the freedom and security in a way of being outside Zimbabwe? I mean, corruption, the looting of public funds, and the plunder of the nation's natural resources must be fought everywhere on social media, on the ground, even those in the diaspora can, can, can engage in these sort of fights because these are legitimate fights. These are fights that are about life and death uh, for the citizens. I'll give you a good example. The majority of our people don't have access to healthcare. The majority of our people are dying in their homes because they don't have access to hospitals. Our nurses and doctors are dying because they do not have uh, sufficient um, personal protective equipment, PPE, during this COVID pandemic. We have had six doctors uh, dying in the past six months, in the past uh, uh, 30 days, sorry. Six doctors have died in the last uh, 30 days. And uh, one of them died yesterday, a very senior surgeon, a very important member of the medical fraternity. And nurses are going to hospital at times wearing blankets in order to protect themselves from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This is caused by the looting of public funds. And I exposed and put the evidence on the table um, uh, in, 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 in 2020, uh, around May, June. And nobody has been sent to jail because corruption is tolerated by political elites in Zimbabwe. I have been sent to jail three times for exposing corruption, uh, for talking against corruption. And yet those who are corrupt uh, are, not, are not sent to prison. Today, I posted something on Twitter, a video, juxtaposing how I was treated when I was in prison. I was put in leg irons. I was put in handcuffs when I was going to court. Today, a ZANU-PF aligned a land baron who was stealing land and selling it to um, unsuspecting uh, citizens went to court wearing a suit like he's going to a wedding. So corruption must be fought everywhere. Cor corruption kills 2,500 women die every year in Zimbabwe trying to give birth. That's the equivalent of 15 jumbo jets uh, uh, crashing every year and killing pregnant Zimbabwean women. This could be avoided if we invested in our hospitals. 
Now, here this thing. We have five central hospitals in Zimbabwe. They uh, only require 50 million US dollars a year for them to run efficiently, the same way a hospital would run in Britain through the National Health Service. But they do not get this funding, 50 million dollars a, a, a year. And uh, 100 million US dollars worth of gold is smuggled by the ZANU PF elites and their surrogates every month which means gold alone worth 100 million is smuggled every month. That is sufficient to run all the central hospitals in Zimbabwe for two years. Uh, 1.2 billion US dollars worth of gold is, is smuggled out of Zimbabwe every year. That is sufficient to run those five uh, central hospitals for 24 years. So corruption kills. That's what I mean all the time when I say corruption kills. It is responsible for thousands of deaths every year in Zimbabwe. So every Zimbabwean has got a responsibility to make sure that they expose and fight corruption wherever they find it. Are you afraid of being arrested again? So a question from Faith Dube, which is how, how nervous and concerned are you about your security? And do you have any sense of who in government or is there one person or a department that's kind of orchestrating these arrests, this kind of deliberate targeting of you? Well, I'm, I'm not afraid of being arrested anymore. I've gone past that. The first time when I was arrested, that's when I was a bit shaken, but not anymore because I know that I'm fighting against evil. Uh, corruption is evil. I'm fighting against uh, evil. Looting is evil. I'm fighting against evil. Plunder, plunder of the nation's natural resources uh, is an evil thing because it, it kills people, as I've just explained. So I'm not afraid of getting a, a, a arrested. Perhaps they might want to kill me. I've gone past that mentally. I'm not afraid of getting killed anymore because I know that I would have died for a good thing. And um, I know that we are all going to die. Um, what I'm doing now is what everybody should have been doing from day one when this crisis started in, in around 2000. Um, if we don't fight against these things and we live in our cocoons where we think we're comfortable, uh, this is going to come and haunt not only us today, but future generations. Because what is being stolen is the future of this country. 40 years from now, um, they will look at us and say, but why did they not do something about it? So I'm comfortable and actually happy that I'm doing my bit uh, and, and, and I'm leaving a good legacy as a journalist. Um, I've used my talent, I've used my skill, I've used my training to do something for my country. And uh, I'm happy that I'll be remembered for the right things. That's what only matters to me. I don't care if they kill me today. I don't care if they arrest me today. I only care about how I'm going to be remembered. And I know that the future will remember me in a better way. You've thought about this a great deal. Can, I, can you talk a little bit about the role of journalism and where it, how it sits, the idea of impartiality and activism and calling for regime change? Because this is a debate, again, that a lot of, that is happening everywhere and a lot of journalists are never quite sure where, where to sit. And in some cases, it's very black and white. You see something that's open theft, open corruption, and it's very clear that you need to act. And in other times, it's, it's a matter of perspective. And I'd, I'd be very interested to know your journey and where, you know, where, you know your thinking of, you know, where you, had, where you started and where you ended up. Well, the state in Zimbabwe would like to caricature me as a regime change agent. Uh, I've never called for the overthrow of the Zimbabwean government, and I will never do that because I'm not, I'm not a politician. I'm a, I'm a journalist. What I've done is to simply use my skills to expose corruption, to expose incompetence in government, to expose uh, our clansmanship in government, to expose all the bad things that are directly related uh, to the suffering of our people, uh, the consequences of our, of our poverty. Um, I have noticed that the state media now refer to me as a political activist, uh, and, and I've, I've just loved it off. Uh, they try to link me to the uh, opposition political parties. I'm not a member of any political party. Uh, the only time I was a member of a political party was when I, when I, when I was excited about uh, being an activist, a uh, student activist when I was in England, when I joined the Labour Party. But I'm, I'm, I've never joined a political party in Zimbabwe. And uh, I'm just doing my work as a journalist. Now, the issue of activism, there's a very thin line between what we do and 
and, and, and activism because sometimes people call us um, uh, activist journalists. And a good example is someone like John Pilger. He's a journalist, um, but there's also activism in how he, he, he does his work, his documentary films, uh, his articles. And I am comfortable with uh, anyone who wants to call me an activist or a journalist, because essentially activism is about being active about something and making sure that you address issues that affect the realities of life in your communities. I mean, this is a kind of absolutely crucial point of reflecting the life of communities and reflecting the entire community. And again, going back to Mark, um, who's asking, can you briefly comment on the government's treatment of the LGBTI community in Zimbabwe and how you feel the local journalism set scene is doing in, um, in advancing the rights of these minority groups? Well, there have been statements that were made by the uh, by, by po political elites, and this is not exclusive just to the ruling party, even to the opposition uh, uh, parties in Zimbabwe. Uh, it's 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 a cultural thing in Zimbabwe, specifically as a cultural thing. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, blame ZANU-PF alone for this. It's something that cuts across the uh, uh, political divide. In fact, that's one thing, uh, ironically, that unites the majority of Zimbabweans. It's something that uh, has been talked about, but my attitude is that, you know, um, there are bigger things in our society and uh, these are issues that we should be addressing in our society. If someone is killed, because they are gay, I would have a problem with it, but I wouldn't want to spend time uh, making social commentary on what people get up to into their bedrooms. It's none of my business, it's their own business. As long as they are consenting adults, that's their business. I think it's about um, it's about basically essentially making sure people aren't killed, aren't discriminated against because of sexuality rather than necessarily having debate over bedrooms. Um, and it's an interesting point about how these movements and groups coalesce on social media. And you've talked about the opposition, you talk about activism and social media. And there's a question from Alexander Rosero, which is saying, in what ways will social media campaigns be galvanized by opposition parties in Zimbabwe? Why are the kind of campaigns and protests so isolated? And why, why, why are these kinds of areas not able to galvanize on social media the way you can as an individual even? Well, it's to do with competencies. Um, I always talk about uh, the three pillars uh, that have become an albatross for Zimbabwe as a country. Uh, there's, there's corruption, uh, the looting of public funds and the plunder, uh, there's repression, and there's incompetence. And this incompetence is not only specific to one group of people, it cuts across society because it has been uh, a society that has been dragged down with a big stone around its neck for 20 years. So the opposition needs to be, um, I would say creative to come up with campaigns that work. I mean, look at what I did on Sunday. I simply sat behind my computer, uh, played an instrumental and sang on top of it and it's gone viral around the world. It's been covered by international television stations. It's been covered by, um, by the, 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 the international media newspapers and we're talking about it and you are from the University of Oxford. That's how important competence is when you are trying to deal with these issues. So I think the opposition in Zimbabwe needs to be creative. They need to go beyond the political caricature that has been put in place by ZANU-PF where people are elected or appointed on the basis of patronage, but they are appointed on the basis of competence. Is it also a generational thing that you think there's kind of a generation younger who might be able to grasp this technology? and the potential of it more easily. I think young people understand social media better than um, better than old people. I'm turning 50 on the 26th of March. I'm not very conversant with uh, Instagram. I know how to use it, but there are certain things that I haven't figured out yet, but I will go and post every day because I've realized that whilst I have got um, almost, uh, I think 300,000 people following me between Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I've realized that I need to engage with the younger audiences uh, because you find them, um, um, uh, uh, I think in most cases on Instagram. And um, I, I, I posted something on Twitter complaining to young people and I called them unfocused. 
And they were very upset with that. And then they came to me and they said, you know what, you need to engage us in a language that we understand. And part of the song that I did, um, the skit called The Loot was part of that. And I've realized that they've responded. So I think as old people or middle-aged people, uh, we need to realize that we need to learn new skills uh, if we are going to have an impact. The majority of voters in every society across the world are the young people. If you want to have your say with them, if you want to impact their lives, if you want to influence how they make decisions and interact with public life, you have to learn the new school skills and use the new two, two social media tools that are available. And this, and, and this applies not only to ruling parties across Africa, but also to the opposition parties. If you look at the uh, presidential campaign in Uganda, Bobby Wine was able to use social media skills and reached across not only young people in, uh, in, uh, in Uganda, but across the continent and across the, the, the world. He even did a song with a major reggae artist, Buji Banton, and they interacted because they, they met through social media. So I think we all need to understand that social media is the new thing and that's how young people communicate i mean i talked about how zimbabwe's uh herald newspaper which used to be the biggest newspaper is selling less than five thousand copies according to the presidential spokesperson and uh, uh you ask yourself where are young people getting their news they're getting it on twitter so if you don't jump onto twitter then you're not able to influence them or to make them understand things from your own perspective you talk about Dem Lute and you have also promised that you'll sing the song at the end of the seminar. So we will get, I'll hold you to that promise. But just talking about it, it's a very important song because it, it was it was lighthearted, it was a joke, but it's basically you singing with the same backdrop to Twitter. It's kind of a song called Dem Lute about the looting in the country. And you're right, it's gone absolutely viral. Can you tell me a little bit about the process? How did you come up with the song? Was it, re was it really targeted? to gain young people or was there some other thinking behind it and did you have a sense that it would be so popular why did you do it you just come out of prison so you also just needed to do something to really let off some steam whilst I, I was in prison I, I reflected on the fact that the majority of people in this country are young and I said I might be speaking uh, uh, on top of their heads uh, engaging using old uh, ways, although I'm using social media, but the the, the format of engagement uh, might be different from, from what might yield results and have a proper political discourse in this country. So I thought, you know, maybe I need to do something uh, funny. Maybe I need to do something that makes them laugh. Maybe they might want to engage more if I do that. So I was seated exactly where I'm sitting and I just played an in instrumental. And then I thought, how do I engage with them? And then I, 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 a line just came to my mind. I was like, them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. No hospital medication, them loot. No fuel in, in their cars, them loot. So them loot is them who are looting the, the political elites. And um, I, 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 I ran it once. I never went back to perfect it. I just took the first copy because it was not meant to be uh, like a, a proper music production so I, I i took it out i put it on, on on twitter and i said let me see how they respond these young people and maybe we can have a conversation and then before i knew it the whole evening of Saturday, everyone was like the loot the loot the loot <laughs> and the next morning i was getting calls from south african radio stations i'm getting calls from british radio stations i'm getting calls from german uh broadcasters like dw and then I realized the effectiveness of um, looking at methods that work in terms of engagement and understanding that you can't be one track minded if you are going to engage. And if you go back to 2008, I covered the 2008 election in America uh, where Barack Obama, Obama emerged as the, as the uh, winner. And he used social media in a way, especially Facebook, that had never been used. He was competing against a very uh, old candidate, John McCain, who was not social media savvy. And um, I would say that much of the uh, impetus that was instilled in Barack Obama's uh, campaign was in understanding that there is a certain way of engaging with young people, where he would then use rap stars like Jay Z to engage 
Um, and he was the master of understanding things. When he went to Jamaica, I remember one of his speeches where the first thing he started uh, when he was speaking as the president of America, the most powerful man, but he went there on the, on the, on the podium and he was like, Wagwan, Jamaica, Watagwan. You know, it's, it's, it's a way he understood that you need to speak in a language that excites them. And uh, that's how I ended up making this thing. And uh, it, was, it was a skit, it was like a joke, but uh, I wanted to see how they would respond and they respond uh, positively. And there are actually two big artists in Zimbabwe who are in the studio now working on a proper song. Um, and there's a big Nigeria guitarist who's going to be working on a song. Uh, and she said she will have it ready by next week uh, because she said, you know, look, this is really uh, motivated, not just Zimbabweans. It went viral in Uganda, I'm told. Old, um, because the issues of corruption and looting don't only affect Zimbabweans, they are an endemic problem in, in the whole continent in Africa. So it has reflections of what's happening, not just in Zimbabwe, but what's happening in Uganda, what's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in South Africa. The degrees might be different because on the Zimbabwean side, they are very high, but the struggle continues, is the same thing. It's also, it would have made a fantastic TikTok video, actually, if you'd got on that platform, and we will hear it later. Thank you. Um, you. You're absolutely right about the power of social media, and the thing that really struck me is that both Zimbabwe and Uganda have also had quite a lot of internet shutdowns, where the government's just switched off the internet at times of civil unrest. How concerned, how, do you think this is an effective tool, essentially? Do you think this is a good way of killing communication? or does it just annoy people and people find ways around it? I mean, an internet shutdown is nothing new to Zimbabweans. It happened in 2019 when there were protests. Um, the government shut down the internet, uh, but citizens uh, became innovative. They went around it, they used VPS. But, but VPN, sorry, not VPS, VPN. Um, but here's the thing, when that happened, there's a company that uh, uh, is based in Zimbabwe that uh, does work for the biggest um, uh, mobile phone money platform in Africa, uh, which is on Safaricom in Kenya. It was affected. That company threatened to leave Zimbabwe because it said we cannot operate in a country where the internet can just be shut for political reasons. Uh, because when the internet was shut in, in Zimbabwe, it affected the servers in Kenya for that company. So there are huge economic implications. But dictators don't care about this in as much as they don't care about investors coming to their country. They only worry about holding on to power and doing anything that keeps them in power. So, but also technology is got a funny way for everything that is made. Uh, there's, there's something that is made also to undo it. So when internet is shut down, it affects perhaps the elderly who don't know how to go around it, but the majority of young people, they now know that, okay, if they shut down the internet, we use VPN. But the tragedy is if the internet companies are ordered to shut down everything. And, 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 and my attitude towards that is that we're living in a society like in Zimbabwe, where I feel that we're already shut down anyway because um, the people in rural areas don't have access to this conversation that you and I are, are, are having at the moment. Ideally, if we were living in a proper constitutional democracy, my discussion with you should have been on radio and Radio Zimbabwe should have been on, on Zimbabwean television because it's an important conversation. But at the moment, we can't do that. Uh, so we rely on social media, but it has its limitations because of the proximity uh, effect that is there between the social media tools and the, the citizens across the country because some don't have access to internet. And even if they have access to internet, they don't have the resources to buy data bundles to listen to this sort of conversations which are important in the way we run our lives and how we interact with public life and officials. There's also an argument for saying there needs to be more local, local language news provision on audio so that it can reach more people in these rural communities in, in ways that they can understand. Um, the other question from Ramisha, who's um, from Pakistan, it's about 
disinformation and misinformation on the inf on the internet because you're right that a lot of the free flow of information in uh, Pakistan, in Zimbabwe as in Pakistan is happening on social media but that also means there's a lot of space for bad actors um how concerned are you about this and also how how much do you see it as your role as a journalist to address these issues I, i'm very worried about disinformation and misinformation and in Zimbabwe it's uh, predominantly uh it those tools, those two tools are used by the state. They disinform, they misinform, they lie, they use crude propaganda to engage with citizens. And you see it through the trolls that we were talking about much earlier in the beginning of the conversation, where they will send people to go and write things that are not correct. Uh, but as journalists, our job is to look at these things uh, on a daily basis and put the correct information out there uh, in order for citizens to be able to make the right decisions about their lives because they need this information and they need information that is truthful. Um, disinformation and misinformation are as old as uh, humankind. Uh, they were disinforming and misinforming about Jesus Christ 2000 years ago. And it's still the case today. And so we, we, these are phenomena uh, that uh, we have to live with, uh, but we can manage that by making sure that the media, the journalists like myself and yourself are able to go out and put the truth in its proper perspective. Um, but that's why we end up getting arrested because we are trying to remove those elements of disinformation and misinformation, crude propaganda, the lies that are put out by repressive states, uh, for instance, to say that Zimbabwe's problems emanate from uh, sanctions, yet Zimbabwe's problems emanate from the looting of public funds, from the plan of the nation's natural resources. So you need now to explain to people in the way that I explained earlier that your hospitals only cost 50 million US dollars to run a year. What is being looted a month from just gold alone is $100 million. That piece of information goes a long way in citizens dismissing uh, elements that come through disinformation and misinformation. But if we are not able to elaborate issues in that manner and context, then disinformation and misinformation will continue carrying the day. And um, I always say to opposition politicians that it's also their role because they are opposing and, and as opposers, they are not merely there to oppose everything, but they're supposed to offer alternative views and they're supposed to correct the propaganda because they are the ones who are chasing after, after votes. It's not only the role of the media, it's also the role of society to make sure that we turn these elements of disinformation, of misinformation, and stigmatize them. The same way uh, 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 the British were able to stigmatize drink driving is the same way we should be pushing towards stigmatizing these elements of uh, disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda. We will never be able to really remove them 100%, but they will always be there. Thank you. You talked about the weakness, the financial weakness of Zimbabwe's media, and this is a real problem. It's a question we've been having about who should pay for the media and how. And each country has a different solution. In some, in some countries, you can easily see how a kind of state-backed media fund could help foster independent journalism. In other places, you think you really don't want the government giving money for journalism. Um, there's questions about whether it should be foundation-funded, foundation-funding journalism, or whether it should be readers, but then what happens when your readers are poor and can't afford to pay? What's your take on, on Zimbabwe's media? Where do you think the kind of financial viability is most likely to come from or where would you like it to come from? I would hope that in a new Zimbabwe, the state would fund uh, instruments of journalism, starting from the training uh, and making sure that, for instance, the laptops that we use are not are not text. The cameras that we use are not text. I mean, I lost my camera as the Zimbabwean government took my camera away and they are refusing to give me this camera uh, because they want to shut me down. Uh, they don't want me to do my work. So a camera that I paid with my own money is being held by the state. Um, the state is actually a, 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 an agent of destroying good journalism in Zimbabwe. And so I think the citizen must also uh, understand that 
maybe they, they, they should consider paying for good journalism. There are good platforms that have been set up in Zimbabwe. If citizens could support that with whatever they do, or, or, or those institutions, whatever they do, uh, if citizens could support with whatever they have, the same way that the Guardian is also supported by its readers, people just give two pounds, someone will give 10 pounds, because you're paying for good journalism, you're trying to support good journalism. But the problem with Zimbabwe is that the majority of our people are poor. So that is a very thin uh, proposition. Uh, perhaps the Zimbabwean diaspora might look at uh, platforms that can be supported. Perhaps the donor communities could do the same thing again until Zimbabwe gets to a point where it can stand on its own because it's, it, it has become a constitutional uh, democracy because media can grow on its own and become commercial where it's not stifled. But at the moment in Zimbabwe, the problem is that media is stifled and nobody wants to put money uh, in those institutions that are doing propaganda work for the ruling party. So you end up getting the state only funding institutions that propagate lies, radio stations that are owned by the state, radio stations that are owned by surrogates of the state. If I were to go to a bank today and say I want to start a radio station, I wouldn't be able to do that to start with because I wouldn't have a license. But let's assume that I had a license. Uh, some of the banks would not want to carry the political risk of funding something that is then perceived to be under government. So they end up um, focusing on their core business is banks or, or, or even institutions like big companies. In other countries, you find that in Britain, there are big companies that will support good journalism as a corporate responsibility. But here in Zimbabwe, you don't find it because these companies are afraid of losing their licenses because the Zimbabwean government uses that power as a way of controlling what is said and what is not said. That's why you have people like me who are independent of the corporate world and independent of the state being jailed because that's the only form that they have left to control us. I don't rely on money from the state or from the corporate world. I go and make a film and the film funds itself. And um, so the only way they can control me is by throwing me into prison. So if we are going to have say good documentary films, when we make these films, perhaps the citizens should consider buying the films for only a dollar or a pound. It goes a long way in trying to build a strong foundation of good journalism in a country. I mean, we have um, we always have a conversation about donor funded journalism. And I know in Botswana, Zimbabwe, a lot of media organizations that are get funded by donors have a different issue about problems of trust. And they're accused of being kind of foreign agents. And you know, this can in, in turn affect how how readers view them and how views um, i mean what do you think of that and also you know i know there are also kind of how do you deal with the accusations that you also because you were you studied abroad you're a neiman fellow how do you how do you convince people in zimbabwe that you are you're acting in the interest of zimbabwe not not some outsiders uh, I mean, the, the good thing in Zimbabwe is that the majority of Zimbabweans don't buy into that drivel that I'm a Western pawn or that I'm a Western puppet or that I'm an agent of regime change. They don't buy the average. I mean, that's why I have a huge following on social media. It's a reflection that our society does not buy into that cheap uh, propaganda. It's propaganda that used to work in the past before the advent of social media because people had no other forms of uh, of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of information. They had no other sources of information. When I met that uh, skit on Sunday, uh, yesterday, I got a skit from a grandmother. Somebody had given a phone to the grandmother, recorded the grandmother singing about uh, Cuba, which is stealing, the looting, the thieving, from an old grandmother in a rural area, uh, which means people understand. Each time I, I'm arrested and I go to my rural area, uh, people dismiss the propaganda that would have put through uh, that would have been put through by the Zimbabwean government through these radio stations. They understand, they empathize with me, they sympathize with me. Um, they, they, they show me sympathy. They say, we are sorry, we know that you're being persecuted because you're telling them the truth. Uh, WhatsApp, people are in family WhatsApp groups, people in rural areas have access to WhatsApp. They now get the information. They get to understand that Hopewell Shimono is a subject of state persecution by the Mnangagwa regime. They understand all that. 
thank you. And that's a perfect note to kind of end on. I'm going to ask you to sign us out with Dem Loot. But before we do, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much, Hopewell, for your reporting, for your for your kind of open-minded attitude to social media, which you're right, has helped create a link between journalism and the audiences in a way that's really, really heartening to see and very important for people to learn from. Two extra kind of housekeeping points. Next week, very pertinently, we have Julia Angwin, one of the founders of The Markup um, on this seminar, talking about the interface between technology and journalism. And also for those of you who are journalists um, with over five years experience, we are accepting applications for our journalist fellowship program. This is the last week, the deadline is the 8th of February and the details are on the website. They're fully funded places. So do take a look and get an application in if, you, if you're interested. And in the meantime, thank you again, Hopewell, for your time. And we've spoken about Dem Loot, and I think it's just too irresistible to pass up the chance. Would you, would you play us out with the, with the performance, please? Okay, I'll do some lines. Them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. No medication, you know, them loot. No schools for people, them loot. No water to drink, them loot. Them loot, them loot, them loot. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining as thank well. And thank you for your courage and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.